Hey everyone, Pastor Kevin, listen, today I have a word from the Lord that I believe is going to be a blessing to your life, strengthen you in your journey. All of us need a shot in the arm in our faith, and I believe that word today is going to do that. Take the next few minutes, spread the word, tell your friends and family this message is coming on. I'm believing it's going to change our lives, and I want you to hang on till the end. I'm going to come back and pray for your needs, and I believe God's going to touch today. Let's jump into this word and be blessed. I'll be back soon. Jeremiah, this, this, this will not feel like a sermon, I pray, because it's not, I, I just be honest with you, I don't, uh, when he sneaks up on you at 3 a.m., you don't have time to do it like you usually do it. But I heard that word. I heard the Lord say to me, I want you to release that over the church today. And I said, what will I call this? He said, just tell him I'm not done with them yet. Hallelujah. Telling you I can leap over a wall and plow through a troop. I feel victory in this room this morning. And if you don't feel it, it's all right. You're going to feel it before he gets through with you. Hallelujah. Oh, glory. Jeremiah. Jeremiah 18.1, the title of this word from the Lord is, he's not done with me yet. The word, verse one, which came to Hedemias. How many love the baby singing this morning? They tore the house apart. word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, arise and go down to the potter's house and there I will cause you to hear my words. And then I went down to the potter's house and there he was making something at the wheel. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again into another vessel as it seemed good to the potter to make it. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter? Says the Lord, look as the clay is in the potter's hand. So are you in my hand, O house of Israel? The instant I speak concerning a nation, concerning a kingdom, to pluck it up, to pull it down, to destroy it. If that nation against whom I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I thought to bring upon it. And the instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it, if it does evil in my sight so that it does not obey my voice, then I will relent concerning the good which I said I would benefit it. I want to preach for a few moments. He's not done with you yet. Help us, Lord. Grace our lives to receive this word that you have delivered to me. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. We call him the weeping prophet born in a city just several miles north of Jerusalem called Anathoth, the son of a high priest. And Jeremiah was a prophet from God who was called to minister primarily to the southern kingdom. We call it the kingdom of Judah or the house of Israel. There were many seasons in his life in which he wanted to stop this prophetic ministry that God had given him. He found himself often riddled with challenges and opposition. People hated him. True prophets don't have business cards they hand out. They don't get on Facebook and tell everybody how wonderful it is to be a prophet. True prophets have enemies. Because true prophets are not concerned about how many followers they have. They're concerned about pointing people to Jesus. I think we need some true prophets in this hour. 
There were many times he felt like giving up and quitting and stopping, and he was often paralyzed with fear. One season of his life, he actually told God, I'm quitting. I'm not going to say anything else about you. Every time I prophesy about your name, it gets me in trouble. So I'm going to go into a cave and I'm going to turn in my prophecy credentials and I'm not going to prophesy anymore. But the Bible said when he got in the cave and got alone and felt like quitting, the Bible said he could not stop because the word felt like fire shut up in his bones. There was a season he felt like quitting and God told him, you can't quit because before you were born, I knew you. He's telling the prophet this after he's born and he's actually involved in his prophetic ministry, feeling like a failure, wanting to quit. And God said, you cannot quit because I called you before your mother knew you. Watch this. And God said to him, I ordained you to be a prophet. Wasn't even born yet, but God ordained him. God will ordain what hasn't even come into the earth yet. That's why some of you are still alive, because God ordained your life. When God ordains you, it doesn't matter what kind of enemy opposes you, what kind of hater hates on you, what kind of people rise up against you. If God be for me, it doesn't matter who is against me. And some of you are here today simply because God has ordained your life. He's ordained your ministry. He's ordained your family. If the devil could have unordained you, he would have already set you off course. But you're going to prosper and be blessed and have victory because God has ordained your life. In fact, let me freak you out and tell you he ordained you before you ever got here, which is why you are here. Because before your mother met your father, at the Long John Silvers before your before they ever got together and thought about going out on a date God saw you before they saw each other and God ordained your life if you are here you are not an accident you are not a circumstance or a happenstance I elbow your neighbor and tell him I'm ordained to be here I'm a, I'm a, God knew me before I was here God saw me coming before I got which is why sometimes I praise him when there's no music going on because I remember that he's been good to me and chose me. I didn't choose God. Somebody asked me when I found God. I don't know when I found God, but I remember the night the Lord found me. He chose us. And he told Jeremiah when he felt like giving up, I ordained you and called you to be a prophet. And he needed this reaffirmation over and over again, even as a prophet of God. And there came this moment in Jeremiah's life where God said to the prophet Jeremiah, I'm going to send you on a field trip. I want you to go down to the potter's house. I want to show you what I want to say to my people. And in order for me to give you the right word, I have to show you this little lesson. And he goes on a field trip down to the potter's house. And the potter's house was probably the shed. And if you walked into the potter's shed, you would see a couple of things. Let me just uh, quickly in, uh, equip you and inform you of what, what would have been found in the potter's house. First of all, obviously you see the potter. The potter was an artisan. He was uh, one that could take something that no one else saw any purpose in. And because of his amazing ability to see something become something, he was not intimidated by just the lump of clay. The potter had a purpose for the lump of clay and saw what it could become. I want to tell you right now that God is the only one who knows what you can become. You don't need to be intimidated by what you don't have. He gave you everything you need to be everything he called you to be. And you need to rejoice today in the fact that the potter is the one putting his hands on your life. I don't know who's tried to put their hands on your life, but I'm telling you right now, God's about to wipe some fingerprints off. God's about to get rid of some fingerprints of people who've tried to manipulate and push and pressure and do things to you that were not in his plan. And God's about to put his hands on some lives and this room so that not one ounce of your potential could ever be wasted. He is the potter. How many are thankful that the potter knows what he's up to? 
not only would you see the potter there, but you would also see the clay. And this is interesting because clay, can you can now go to Michael's or you can go to some other store. You can go to Walmart and you can go into the craft section. You can buy lumps of clay. But the potters of the day of the Bible had no such privilege. They had to go out into the field and there was a certain kind of, of, of composition they were looking for in the dirt because there was a certain kind of dirt uh, that was the kind of clay that the potter would need. And literally what they do, they would hew this dirt, this this clay out of the ground and they would carry it back and it was too hard in its current state to be useful. So they would take the clay back and they would put the clay out on the ground and they did what was called treading the clay. And they would walk over the clay and they would pound the clay with their feet and they were breaking the clay down to make it you I'm talking to somebody right now they would break the clay down to make it useful because hard clay has no future Hard clay has no future. But a potter understands if I can break the clay down, it's the right stuff. I just have to get it in the right position so that I can maximize its potential. And I felt like there was some clay in the room that needed me to encourage you and tell you that some of the stomps you've been feeling, some of the pressure you've been feeling, some of the weight you've been feeling, the enemy has tried to tell you that that weight was intended to destroy you. But I feel like God wanted me to tell somebody God's been treading the clay of your life. Why? Because he loves you too much to leave you arrogant. He loves you too much to leave you proud. He loves you too much to leave you without a tear on the edge of your eye. Uh -huh. You got too much pride and you got too much I know I can in you for God to be able to use you like he wants to use you. But when you come out of this season of being treaded and you feel like you've been broke down, God said that's what I've been waiting on. You feel like you're useless and now I'm about to show you how useful you really are. If the enemy has pressured you into feeling like it's time to give up, you are actually in the place for God to begin to blow your mind through what he is about to do in your life. It, are, it is not the people who came this morning who know that God's hand is on their life and they know they're all that in the bag of chips. I'm thankful those people are here, but the real folk that God is about to bless and the real folk that God is about to use are the folk that came in here by faith today and something has been pounding on your life and something has been treading on your spirit and you've been feeling broken on the inside and God sent me to tell you you are in the right spot to become everything God has called you to be. There's the potter, there's the clay and there's the wheel and nobody likes the wheel. Nobody likes the wheel. The wheel is the place that makes sure the potter touches every part. Sculptors focus on the face. Painters focus on the canvas. But potters touch every side of the vessel. Because potters recognize that if they're going to be useful, I got to touch every part of their life. And in order for me to touch every part of their life, I got to keep them on a wheel. Has anybody ever gotten tired of being on the wheel? I know y'all don't want to say nothing to me because it's graduation Sunday and you got a nice suit on and we came to impress everybody. But I need somebody to be real today and say, yes, Lord, I'm tired of the wheel. I'm tired of feeling like I'm going in a circle and that nothing good is coming out of my situation. I want to tell you that the circle is leading to significance. And that spin that you've been in is about to reveal that God has been working not just on the places people see, but on the unseen hidden places of your life because God sees too much in your future to allow you to look right from one angle but be jacked up at another angle and so that he doesn't waste your potential he's got you in this circle and he's touching every place of your life and so Jeremiah comes on this field trip to the potter's house and he sees the potter and he sees the clay and he sees the wheel. And the potter, let me stay in the text. The potter is working at the wheel 
And the Bible said he was making something. Read the text. He was making something. He didn't even tell them what he was making. But he was making something. Have you ever had people who look at you and say, well, what is the Lord doing in their life? Like, I, I want to, I can't figure them out. That's by design. God is doing some stuff in your life for some of you that is a secret. It's a top secret. It's, in fact, you don't even know what he's doing. <laughs> Have you ever had God be up to something in your life when people say, what is the Lord doing for you? Something. I don't know. It's something. I need to put some nosy people on notice right now that God is hiding my purpose from everybody. You don't understand what he's up to. There are some people that don't understand you. They don't understand the chemistry and the makeup of your attitude and why you are like you are. And they know some stuff about your past and they know some stuff and some flaws and some kinks in your armor. And they don't understand how God is doing something so wonderful in your life. And the next time some nosy somebody comes up and says, well, how did you, do, what is the Lord doing? for something. I don't have to be able to tell you everything about my future to know that God is up to something in my life. I need some people to praise God this morning for the something. Even if you don't know what it is, I need you to praise God that is up to something. If I could tell you every detail, I would tell you. If I knew the future, I might share it with some of y'all. But he hasn't even let me know what he's up to in my own life. But I trust that whatever he started, he is faithful to finish it. He is powerful enough to complete it. Touch somebody, tell him something, something. God is up to something in my life. In fact, encourage your neighbor right now and tell your neighbor, I can't see it all, but I know he's up to something in your life. He was working on something. And the only one who knew what God was up to, the only one who knew what the potter was making was the potter himself. Can I tell you that God won't even disclose all of it to you? And don't act to me because I know why he didn't tell me everything I would go through to get to where I am and he hadn't shared with me where I'm going to get to where he's taken me. Why? Because I would screw it up. Let me go over here and preach. If he told you every detail about what you were going to go through, don't look at me and be like, yeah, I would take it. I would accept it. No, you wouldn't. Uh, you would not take the sleepless nights and the betrayal and the nights of the soul and the pain on the inside and the stuff going on on the outside. If God showed you every kind of pressure you would ever go through, you would look at that picture and that commercial of your future and you would say, I can't do that. Well, there's a reason why God don't show you because you can actually handle more than your own mind tells you you can handle. I want to tell you, he will never, I feel like preaching right here, he will never put anything on you more than you can bear. And he is the only one who knows what you can bear, so he doesn't even disclose all of the information about it to you. He just says, if you trust me, I'll give you the strength, oh God. I'll give you the ability. I'll give you the anointing and when you get to the end of this journey, you won't come to heaven talking about, look what I did. You'll come to heaven saying, look what the Lord has done. Look what God did in my life. Why don't you encourage somebody right now and tell your neighbor, say, neighbor, he's up to something. Can you praise him at times when you don't know what he's up to? But do you trust him enough to say thank you even when he's up to something that you can't see? Have you ever gotten into something and thought it was one thing and it turned out not to be the something that you thought it was? But when you turned around, it became something altogether better, something altogether another level. Some of us need to learn how to pray. Praise God that even when it doesn't turn out like we thought it would, he's still up to something. He's still doing something. I am persuaded that everything works together for the good to them that love God and those who are the called according to his purpose. He's up to something. He's up to something and he's working on this something. 
and Jeremiah's watching him work. And then the Bible says that the vessel he made was marred. We lost the shout. We lost the shout. And I know why. Because so many of us in this room can relate to that moment. Jeremiah is watching the potter make a vessel. And it keeps going around and around and around. And the hand of the potter knows where to put the pressure to make the lump of clay become the vessel that it is intended to be. And when it got stiff and dry, he would take some water because you can't make clay into a vessel without some water. And you can't make a saint into everything God wants them to be without the spirit. So every time you get a little attitude about you, God will throw some more Holy Ghost on you. Every time you get all bowed up and act like you've arrived, God will put the spirit on you to bring you back to a place. Y'all not talking to me. I'm telling you right now, some of y'all, you, we, and when I started talking about Pentecost today and the Holy Ghost, some people said, well, I don't, that ain't my style. That ain't my brand. Let me help you something, Sister Yay Yay. The Holy Ghost is not a flavor of the month. The Holy Spirit is not a choice. It's not like we get to be the church without the Holy Spirit. This nonsense of, well, we go, we're going to be the church, but we don't want the Holy Ghost. You can't be the church without the Holy Ghost. That's too much pride in the church for us to be able to be the church without the Holy Ghost. Y'all looking at me funny, but I'm telling you right now, there's too many liars in here that if you didn't have the Holy Ghost, you would keep on lying. There's too much lust in here that if we didn't have the Holy Ghost, we'd keep on lying. We don't need just another church. We need the Holy Ghost. Well, do you have, are you saying, do you need the Holy Ghost to go to heaven? I need the Holy Ghost to go to a gas station. He put water on that and when he just kept turning it on the wheel and he kept working it, and he made it a vessel. It actually was a vessel. And some people would have said, this is what he made, look what he made. But the potter noticed something that no one else in the room noticed, and that is that there was a mar. It literally in the Hebrew is a word that they use for spoil. The vessel was made, but it was spoiled. And spoiled not in the sense that it was bad fruit or bad vegetables that went rotten. Spoiled in the sense that it could not be used for the intended purpose. Spoiled. Disqualified from being a vessel because it had something wrong with it. Perhaps Jeremiah couldn't see it because he seems a bit shocked that this vessel has been made, but the potter is getting ready to do something different because he, the potter knows something about the vessel that jeopardizes its usability. I want to tell you that there are some people in this place today who need to get a revelation of the stubborn potter. We are not serving a God who is just uh, okay and acquiescing to uh, our whines and cries when the pressure is on and we don't get what we want and we start throwing our hands up and oh, I can't take this anymore. You would think that some people, you would think that some, some gods would be like, oh, if you go, if, 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 okay, if you're not happy, let me make you happy. God is not concerned about our happiness. He wants us to be useful and in order to be useful, he is willing to work on you and I in one season and to bring us to a place that some people would say you're a finished product and when some people would put their hands on our life and say we are a finished product God is stubborn and says there's something about you that I can't ignore but I made a couple of observations that I just want to bring to your, uh, just, just for your consideration today about this text. The first thing I want you to see is that even when it was marred, he did not throw it away. God, I'm about to preach. I 
need to praise God this morning that when I was a mess, he didn't throw me away. I don't know about you, but there are a lot of people in your life and in my life that when they discovered something in me, they discovered something in you that the naked eye could not see. They got close enough and they saw the mess. They got close enough and they saw that thing in your life. That There's some people that would have said, oh, I'm going to have to go to plan B and get another lump of clay. But I'm here to report to you that when God finds that mess in me and you, he does not throw the clay away. Now, you can sit out there and act like you know you deserve to be here and you deserve to have the life you got and you have earned your way into saying you feel good about your performance. But the reality of it is there's enough in all of us if we took real inventory of our life, we ought to really praise him till the roof flies up off this room because we know there were plenty of opportunities that he could have thrown us away, but he did not throw the clay away. I am not a different lump of clay than I was 10 years ago. I'm the same lump of clay, and every time he finds something in me that's not like him, he doesn't go get another somebody and try to put them in my place. He said, get your tail back up on the wheel. I'm not finished with you yet. So, he did not throw the clay away. He made it again. He didn't use another lump. He made the same lump another vessel. This is why you can't judge people according to the flesh because you see them in one season and 10 years later you see the same lump of clay. The hair got a little grayer and their body doesn't look as fit as it used to and they're not quite as fit as they used to be and you know they went through some stuff and you look at their life and you say oh, they're disqualified. Look at that lump of clay. I'm telling you I'm telling you it's not that it's a different lump of clay God's going to use. You can't look at them and say their life is over just because of one season because God will take that same person that is that same lump of clay and in his stubborn long suffering kindness mercies that are new every morning. He will put them up on the wheel and get back to work on their life. I need somebody to praise God that he didn't throw you away. He, he made it again, again. He made it again, another vessel. Same clay, different vessel. Some of y'all gonna have to get used to that in your own life. Same you, different vessel. <laughs> have you ever went through such a transformation at a metamorphosis? Where people who knew you in one season saw you a different season sometime later and said, that looks like her. She's still got that same weave. She's got some new extensions. He, he got some missing hair now, whatever. It looks like them, but there's no way that that person could be this person. You, you see, the problem with us in religion is we throw clay away when we come into something that feels like a disqualification. But God doesn't throw clay away. Why? Because the power to change is not in the clay. God, I feel like preaching. The power to change is not in the clay. The power to change is in the hand of the one that is manipulating and touching the clay. I'm not here today because I think I have figured my future out. I'm here today because I'm trusting somebody. Oh God, I feel the Holy Ghost. I'm trusting somebody has the power to take what I am as screwed up as I may be 
and work me in a way that brings honor and glory to the king so that when I finish my journey, it's not unto me, but it's unto him. He doesn't throw the clay away. Second observation, he just makes it again. How many are thankful for agains? Some of the most judgmental people you ever meet in your life are in church. Mean, terrorist. Uh, that's a strong word, Bishop. Uh, it's a terrorist. Terrorizing your mind, stealing your joy, running around with the Bible and using it like a sword to cut people's head off. You failed. Slash their head off. We do that. God don't do that. Let me help all of us understand something. If God wanted to get us, we'd have been gotten. If you're alive, his mercies are new. If you're still alive, his mercies are new. And you would be amazed at sitting in a room with 12, 13, 1400 people. You would be amazed at how many different ways of thinking about God exist in this room right now. People who are sitting here thinking God is out to get them. And the reason some of you are thinking that is because your pastor and your preacher all your life you were raised, and I was, hearing people tell you, you better live right. God's going to get you. So we hear that all of our life, and we come to church, and whenever we say God's about to come into the room, uh-oh, I better go get my stuff, get my kids, and run to the car, because if God is coming, he's coming to get me. Well, let me help you, and let me fix something right now. God is coming. The glory is going to rush into this room, and he didn't come to get you, because if he wanted to get you, he would get you in here or at your Honda Accord out in the, lot, in the, in the car lot. He'll make you again. And he won't throw your lump of clay away and get a new lump. He'll take who you are, put you back up on the wheel, and put those hands of grace on your life. Throw some water on it and just keep applying pressure and do it all over again. And the third observation I have about this text is not only did he not throw the clay away and not only did he make it again, but he, this is what I think is crazy. It was marred, but at no point did it cease to be in the hand of the potter. Aren't you thankful you can be messed up and still in his hand? In fact, freak your neighbor out right now and tell your neighbor on both sides, you're still in his hand. Now, religion will tell you he threw you away, but I came to tell you what the text said. He still had them in his hand. Aren't you thankful that God doesn't get rid of you and me and throw us? Uh, not did he not just throw them away? He kept his hands on the clay. I'm thankful that even when I wasn't everything I could have been, I was still in his hand. And Jeremiah is watching all of this happen. And he sees the clay become one vessel. He doesn't like, the potter doesn't like what it is, so he just makes it again. And God asked the question to the prophet that I came to ask you, that at three o'clock this morning, I felt like the Lord rang my bell and said to me, can I not do for you what the potter has done with this clay? I might have come to talk to one person, so let me find him real quick. He's not done with you yet. Right. 
this is news for you because you've been listening to somebody else's news about you. And I want to tell you that the potter sees what you're going to become before he ever started. Here's what I want you to hear me say to you. When the potter got through with making it again, don't miss it, the Bible said it was good. Same word used in creation's narrative. God made man and said it's not good for man to be alone. So the Bible said he put a sleep, took a rib out of his side, made woman from the rib of a man when he woke up. He said, man, that's good. God made creation in seven day, six days, took a break on the seventh day. Before he took a break, he stepped back from all he had created, created and he said, this is good. God takes a lump of clay. Y'all don't hear what I'm telling you. God takes a lump of clay, puts it on the wheel. The potter takes his hands and makes the lump of clay into a vessel. Everybody thinks the vessel is a finished product. It looks amazing, but the potter is so, uh, he's so incredibly tedious, and he wants exactly what he wants from that lump of clay. And when everybody else would have said it's just fine, the potter felt something in it that ruined it from being everything it had called to be. So he doesn't throw the clay away. He keeps his hand on the clay. He keeps the clay on the wheel. He keeps the water on the pile of clay and he keeps working it and does it again and again and again and again until he gets to something called good. I want to preach right now that there's another thing coming out of you and when God brings this next thing out of your life, it's not just going to be a decent season. It's not just going to be an okay season. God is about to do something and when people say it, see it, they're going to say how could you go through that and still come out good? Oh, I need to praise you, Lord. I need to thank you, God, that you are the God who takes the seasons in which I've been marred, the seasons in which I have felt like a failure, the seasons in which I felt like I screwed it all up. You kept your hand on my life, and you made it good. Ah, oh, can we praise him this morning? Not that everything has been good, but that everything that happened worked in a way that turned out for my good. Can you ever testify about going through some bad stuff, but the bad stuff somehow turned into something that is good? I've come to talk to some people. You made a mistake. I felt in my time of prayer this morning like somebody in this room, you just came out of an affair. You just came out of adultery. The devil, you don't like this, but I'm talking to somebody in this room right now. The devil told you God will never bless you. God don't love you. Your future is too screwed up and God cannot help your life. I come to tell you that the Bible said in John 8 44 that the devil is a liar and the father of every lie. If you've fallen down and made a mess of your life, get up out of the mess and get back on the wheel. Turn from your sin. Turn to the living God where sin does abound. Grace does much more abound. Somebody needs to praise him that even though you made a mess, your life is not over. I felt like somebody in here had a business thing go bad. And the devil told you, God can't bless you in your business anymore because your business went under. But just stay on the wheel. If you let him keep working on you, something good's coming out of it. The only way something bad comes out of it is if you jump off the wheel. If you jump off the wheel and let God get his hands off your life, God can't help you. I call my Shia, but I feel like God sent me to intercept somebody's intention. You, you have actually said in your heart, I'm going to quit church and I'm going to stop serving God because I have messed my life up and there is no way God can rescue it. And I came to tell you he's better to you than you've ever been to yourself. God is able to take the lump of clay that you are and as messed up and disqualified and marred as the, in the hand of the potter as you feel like you are, his hand is still on your life. That is why you have not died. That is why you have not lost everything. That is why you still feel a tear well up in you while I'm preaching like this. That is why your prayer life is coming back to life. That is why you've been reading the Bible lately. You hadn't even got what you've been looking for, but you're searching for it. And the reason you're searching is because 
because you know he's good and he's too good to leave your life in a chapter of defeat. Yes, I have made a mess. Yes, I am marred. Yes, I got problems. But I'm here today because I believe you're not done with me yet. You're not done with me yet. And there is going to come a moment in your journey, I pray it's this morning, where you say, I'm going to stay on this wheel to see what the end is going to be. O oh Israel, can I not do with you as the potter has done with this clay? Oh, Trevor, oh, Susie, oh, Jim, oh, Bob, oh, Jones House, oh, Smith family. Y'all want me to come for you? I'm coming. I'm going to call out every name to somebody, shouts or cries or something. Oh, House of Smiths, oh, House of Wallaces, oh, can I not do for you as this potter has done? Oh, God, I feel like getting happy in my soul. Some of you have thought God could bless everybody else but your lump of clay. But I'm telling you right now, when God found the mess in your house, he didn't run from your house. He put his hands on your house, and his hand is still on your house. And I came to tell you, he's working out the mess in your house. Don't despise the pressure. Don't despise the problem. Don't curse the issues. Don't even curse your enemy. What if I told you God was about to use your enemy to to work out of you some of the stuff that was still in you. Y'all don't hear what I'm, I gotta go, I gotta go here. But God is even able to use your enemy as a tool to bring you into your purpose. God is able to use the stuff, that's why when Peter told Jesus, you don't need to go to the cross, Jesus looked at a man trying to keep him from suffering and Jesus said to the friend who was trying to keep him from suffering, get thee behind me, Satan, you savorous not the things that be of God. How could Jesus call a man who was trying to keep him from suffering an enemy? Uh -huh. A few chapters later, a man who was actually an enemy, who was setting him up for the cross, who sold him for 60 to 30 pieces of silver, Jesus looks at the betrayer, kisses him on the cheek, and he calls him friend. How can you call somebody who's trying to keep you from the mess an enemy and somebody trying to lead you to the mess a friend? Because if you're Jesus, you understand that even your betrayer is setting you up for Sunday morning resurrection. Your enemy, the thing you've been trying to curse, is the very thing God will use to put you in a position to be revealed as everything God called you to be. He's not done. He's not done. He's not done with you yet. How do I know when God is done with me? When it gets good. When life starts lining up and things start happening and you, you see the favor of the Lord breaking out on your life, you may tend, be tempted to believe it's done. But I have come to discover in my life that in even seasons when I felt done, there was stuff in me. Y'all don't want to talk about the stuff in you, so let me talk about the stuff in me. There was stuff in me that he had to keep working out of me. He didn't just throw the clay away. He said, oh, Wally, come up on the wheel. Get back up here, son. I love you too much to allow you to spoil your own future. Let me tell you where I'm through here. Let me tell you when I get concerned. I get concerned when I see people who jump off the wheel. Preachers. Who stand up and start talking like they've arrived. 
I made it. I get nervous for them. Because any moment you start acting like you've arrived, you take yourself off that wheel. And the wheel is where he just keeps working out of you everything that jeopardizes your future. Paul says something over in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, that is in keeping with this assignment today. He said, I am persuaded that he is able to complete and finish everything he started in my life all the way up until the day of Jesus appearing. Which means this, there'll never be a day in your living life on planet Earth where you've arrived. The only time we'll arrive is when we walk up to the throne and we come in boldly and we come in with our crowns and we look at the one who was stubborn enough to love us and keep us when everybody else would have thrown us away. When you get to heaven, won't nobody have to beg you to praise the Lord. I promise you down here, we always like praise, praise. Everybody clap, clap, jump, clap. Heaven, when your eyes see him, the one who kept you, the one who worked on you when everybody else stopped working with you, when they walked off, he kept on working. And you won't be finished till that day. So what's the point? Stay on the wheel. This message should be interpreted in two ways. For the hopeless, he's not done with you yet. For the arrogant, he's not done with you yet. Well, I've arrived. I got a nice job. I got money in the bank. I don't care. He ain't done with you yet. You still cuss people out at red lights, flip people off on the interstate, and cut people off on another lane. He ain't done with you. He ain't done with us. And sometimes I look at all the stuff in me that I don't like about me. Man, I say, how could he ever use me? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Why would he ever put up with me? I was telling the students last night, in a season in the past, I had a child. This was some time ago, but I had a child who was searching for purpose. I've searched for, I think all of us have been on that search for purpose. And I remember a little video I saw when my kids were little. I, my, son, my, my son, my daughter, they come to us at different times. All of us need direction at different times. How many know what I'm talking about? And one time in this season, one of my children came to me needing some direction and the Lord quickened in me with the most prophetic thing I have ever used in my life, Hermie the common caterpillar. Y'all don't know who Hermie is. Hermie was a common caterpillar who came to God. And he said, look, my friend the ant, he got all this strength. My friend the grasshopper can jump over a building. The bees pollinate. And here I am, a caterpillar crawling with no purpose. And you, you hear this voice that sounds like God talk to the little caterpillar on this little video. It said, Hermie, I'm not finished with you yet. And he throw his hands up in disgust. Well, that, that don't help me none until one day he goes into a chrysalis. And I, I don't even want to go down this road. But I found out studying that there's a difference between a cocoon and a chrysalis. Y'all don't want me to go biologically on you right now. Do you know that butterflies don't go into cocoons? How many have ever been told a butterfly goes into a cocoon? Lift your hand. Don't lie. You'll go to hell. Come on. All my life, I've been told butterflies go into cocoons. That is not true. Butterflies go into chrysalis. Moths go into cocoons. How many ever took a picture of a moth because it was beautiful? Nobody. In fact, we buy mothballs to kill moths. Come on, somebody. Moths are ugly, they're, 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 they're dirty, and, and they don't have any beauty about them at all. They go into cocoons. 
And as I was studying this, a cocoon is just a thing. Just a thing. It uses it and never goes back to it again. The moth never flies back to it again. But a butterfly, a chrysalis forms out of its own inner self. And when it comes out of a chrysalis, it's not a moth, a moth that's, you know, drab and dull. It's a beautiful multicolored butterfly that comes out of this chrysalis and breaks out. And I, rem I was talking to this child of mine, and they were looking for purpose. And I said to them, God's not finished with you yet. And I feel like as childish as that is, somebody in this room today is frustrated with where you are in your life. And I've been sent to tell, I woke up at three o'clock for somebody today to tell somebody, he's not done with you yet. He's not done with you yet. There's so much more to the story. He's not done with you yet. He's not done with you yet. He's not done with you yet. There's so much more to the story. He's not done with. Don't stand with me, I'm through preaching. Don't put a period where God put a comma. I feel like one of the assignments of the enemy in this hour is to get you to forget the faithfulness of God. But you're not here today because you were wise enough to last this long. You're here today because he kept, God kept his hand on your life. And I feel like God wanted me to tell a handful of people, maybe everybody, but I know a handful of people. He wanted me to tell you, he's not done with you yet. It's the message. I look at mighty, a mighty man of God standing right here in front of me. Chad McDonald, who God uses all over the world, preach the gospel. Mighty evangelist, goes to nations. I feel like I'm praying for him every week. He's in some nation shaking jungles and turning tribes upside down for the glory of God. But you want to know something? I remember the night at Rod Parsley's church where I preached on prophets coming out of caves. And you came out of a cave that night because God wasn't finished with your life yet. I can go down the rows of this church and tell you the stories of the faithfulness of God. And he, he doesn't, he, when Jeremiah went down to see what God was doing, he didn't go to a trophy house. He went to a potter's house. Sometimes we want to show everybody our trophies Sometimes it's those vessels. Those vessels that are just on the potter's wheel. That ain't everything that they were going to be yet, but God is just stubbornly good. I want you to reach over and lay your hand on your neighbor's shoulder right now. Find a neighbor to, to, to lay your hand on their shoulder in a, in a gracious way. I, Lord, I could go down the row. I'm looking at people, Gigi and Carrie. Went through divorce. Can I tell the story? Is that all right? Went through divorce. Walked away from each other, got with other people. And when God got them on the wheel, got remarried and have been living in the power of the Holy Ghost and a member of this church for seven years. Don't you tell me this stuff don't work. Don't you tell me grace don't work. I'm, I'm, I'm touching the shoulder of a man and a woman right now who are living witnesses that God 
will finish what he started if you'll just stay on the wheel. Hallelujah. I want you to pray for your neighbor right now that any hopelessness that God has through with their life would be broken off right now and that everything God is up to in them, everything that he has purposed for them, the Spirit of the Lord would begin to just manifest it and remind them through this word today that his hand is still on their life. Come on, pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for people who felt like giving up and quitting, people who felt useless, disqualified, and like their best days were behind them, people who the enemy has persuaded to believe they don't have a future. There's a preacher in here who felt like you failed so bad you can't preach anymore. You have made such a mess of your life that God can't use you anymore, and I came to break that off of you and to tell you he's making you again into another vessel. And this ministry that God's given you, it might turn out a little different than what you thought, but I'm going to tell you right now, your purpose is still in place. If you'll stay on the wheel and stay yielded to God, he's not done with you yet. He's not done with you yet. There's so much more. There's so much more to your story. You're not done with me. Sing. He's not done with me yet. You're not done with me yet. There's so much more. There's so much more to the story. Somebody throw your hands up and You're begin to believe it. Everybody declare it over your own life. You're, You're not, not done, done with me yet. Hallelujah. You're not done with me yet. There's so much more to the story. Come on, family, one more time. You're not done with me yet. You're not done with me yet. You're not done. I recognize this word hit different for different people, but if it hit you because you know you've been feeling like he's done with you and you needed him to be, you needed to be reminded of him that he is not done with your life yet. I want you to come to the altar with your hands lifted right now and everybody else that has to go, we love you, go in the peace of Jesus. Youth, don't forget Bible study tonight for the youth that's happening tonight, but I need someone in this room who feels like this word was for you and your house. I just need this thing, the feeling that I have. I've been operating under this heaviness that God is through with my life, and I just want to testify that I believe he's not done with me yet. I want you to get to the altar right now. I need intercessors praying and worshipers worshiping. If you got to go again, we love you. Go in the peace of God. But the Spirit of the Lord is about to break some chains over people's lives. He's about to break. You need this chain broken if you're feeling it because there's nothing more paralyzing than the fear and the feeling that God is through with you and God is just about to get started. If I'm talking to you, I'm going to give you about 30 more seconds to get to this altar with me right now because the Spirit of the Lord is going to break some people through out of hopelessness into a place of hope, into a place of hope. God's going to use you in your future. Come on. Come to the altar and lift your hands. I need prayer leaders to come help me right now. If, I'm going to do something I don't usually do on Sunday, but if you know that God is able to take a messed up life, uh -huh, if you know because you're a witness it's happened in your own life that God has used His grace to make another vessel out of the lump of clay and you want to help me pray, I'm going to ask you to come. Don't lay your hands on anybody except on their head lightly. You don't push anybody down, but if God's ever turned your life around, I'm going to invite those who've experienced that grace. I want my students to come. I want the preachers to come. I want everybody that's going to stay to lift up your hands and begin to thank God that the grace of God that brings restoration and renewal, that kind of grace is in this room today. And you're not done with me yet. Come on. You're not done with me yet. I want you to pray for people all over this place right you're now. Not done with Hey family, I believe God is touching hearts right now. The preached word of God causes the lost to come to Christ. I believe someone's watching. Maybe you feel a million miles away from God. Maybe you've been in church. Maybe you've never been in church. Listen, I want to tell you that it doesn't matter where you are in life right now. If you want Christ to save you, no matter what you've done and no matter how long you've been doing it, if you'll turn your heart to him, he'll save you right now. 
I want to lead you in a prayer. Say, dear Lord, I confess that I'm a sinner. And Jesus, I'm asking you to save me from my sin. Save me from myself. Lord, come in and be the king of my life. I give you my past, my present, and my future. And I'm asking you, Lord Jesus, to rescue me today. In Jesus' name, by faith, I believe that I'm saved and a child of God. Amen. Listen, friend, I know that's a simple prayer, but I believe with all of my heart, salvation is as simple as turning from sin and turning to Christ. If you did that today, I, I want to pray that God give you a strong Bible-believing church. I want you to go to KevinWallace.tv, learn how the resources that we have can help you in your journey. Listen, we want to pray for you. Drop us a line on the prayer request. Let us know you gave your heart to Christ. And our team's going to be praying for you this coming week. You're going to get stronger. You're going to grow deeper in your love for God. You're going to become everything He put you on this planet to be. I'm praying for you. I love you. I'll see you next week. God bless.